So welcome everybody to uh, return of the Hegel Reading Group. So for those of you who are new here, this is a reading group that's kind of been going on at the University of Warwick for three or four years now. And we, we started it online around May or something. And so, yeah. And then we started reading from the start of uh, objectivity. We read the sections on mechanism and chemism. And today we'll be starting teleology. So for those of you who are new to this sort of thing, uh, the format is that we will read a section, one of us will read it out loud and we'll do this on rotation and then we'll try to figure out um, contents of what we just read. And uh, if you are like new to Hegel, this is going to be pretty hard stuff. Uh, but I encourage you to stay with us as uh, I, in, my, in my own experience has always been that uh, uh, the more you stay on with the group and the more you engage with it, it will eventually sort of start to kick in and the text will open itself up. So, Mert, do you want to do a summary of uh, what we read last time in uh, Mechanism and Chemism? You know, just give us the short lowdown, 30 seconds, go. <laughs> nice joke, really. <laughs> I think Bill could do it, definitely. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I, I, I hazard to try. Um, yeah, um, um, <clears throat> the things which stick in my mind are, are coming through the syllogism with a great degree of difficulty. I, I wasn't there for judgment and I think the concept, so I only began with the syllogism. Um, and in a sense, the working to put together the, the parts of the concept. Um, I don't seem to have a blank and, and uh, um, jump to mechanism and chemism, um, which, which were, I mean, in lots of ways, I feel as though Hegel is there, very much dealing with the science of his day, um, constructing his um, approach to that relationship between the subject and substance um, right at the forefront of the science of his day, having a look at the object, uh, the determination from outside of the uh, of the objects in mechanism and chemism uh, and um, here we are uh, and, uh, and then he ends the last session uh, pointing towards um, some internal self-determination of 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 objects of the concept um and that is purpose and that is where we arrive at today <sighs> sorry that's a pretty good step uh, at it uh, bill yeah. thanks for that yeah i think you're exactly right so objectivity or object is defined by uh yeah. something uh, being what it is independently of any relations it might form with anything else. Yeah. But then this excluded that very determination. And so I think um, the trouble with um, an object as it's initially conceived is that it runs up by a contradiction with itself, right? Because it's being defined as independent, but it's not giving that definition to by itself, it's, it garners that from another object. But throughout the um, logic, um, the, um, Hegel shows that implicit in this is that there is some sort of self-organization at work. But for that to obtain, we need to have a sense of a process and then the sense of a uh, uh, and a properly mechanistic structure where you have elements that are mediating each other. 
as in facilities. So the, the examples he uses are like estates and solar systems. So the idea of objects organizing themselves without any sort of outside um, interaction within that system. That's kind of what mechanisms are about. And then chemism deals with that on a different level. And so we, we begin here today with a even higher sense of self-organization or self-determination, which is going to be in teleology. So I propose we just uh, get into the text and kick things up. Adam, would you like to read? Uh, can you hear me now? Is there like a delay thing going on? Or is it cool? Uh, okay. So, um, chapter three, teleology. Where there is perception of a purposiveness, an intelligence is assumed as its author. Required for purpose is thus the concept's own free, concrete existence. Teleology is above all contrasted with mechanism in which the determinateness posited in the object being external is the one that gives no sign of self-determination. Uh, the opposition between cause uh, efficients, causae efficientes probably or something like that, and causae finales, I guess this is uh, like Aristotelian categories probably, uh, between merely efficient and final causes refers to this distinction just as at a more concrete level the inquiry uh, whether the absolute essence of the world is to be conceived as blind mechanism or as an intelligence that determines itself in accordance with purposes also comes down to it. The antinomy of fatalism, along with determinism and freedom, is equally concerned with the opposition of mechanism and teleology. For the free is the concept in its concrete existence. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, so the way things work is just like when people have thoughts, ideas, or questions, they just, they just um, bring it up to the group. Um, maybe one interesting remark here could be, um, maybe it, it's kind of like reference to the, um, to the introduction that Bill and you gave, actually. So, like, um, so Hegel, Hegel here says that, that, that the, I mean, in mechanism, there is a determinateness in the object, but this is kind of externally positive. So like, even though, I mean, we read the um, chemistry, not, not chemism and, and, and the, um, oh, I forgot the other one. And mechanism is a kind of like self-organization or self-determination. I think Hegel is kind of a little bit hesitant to call the processes happening in chemism and mechanism as a sort of self-determination, I guess. Because there's still a kind of element of externality. externality. I mean, as you said, like, I mean, the object is determined in so far as there's another object involved in itself, or I mean, involved in some sense, like not only internally, but could be external. Uh, yeah, I agree. There is still a separation involved. Mm -hmm. That's not so we great. don't have a kind of a proper self determination in, in objectivity. Maybe the, the, the teleology is going to be the category that we are going to have the proper self determination. I mean, self determination in the sense that, like, a, a, an object that determines itself through its inner determinations, not something externally positive in it. Kind of like producing its determination out of itself. But whereas in the previous parts of the mechanism, the previous parts of the objectivity, like mechanism and chemist, chemism, we have the externality posed, I mean, we have the determinateness posited to the object. So it's kind of like put in front of it and then trying to understand it's the relation of the object to another object. But here, probably we are going to see a kind of like self-productive uh, determinations 
for the object itself through which it determines itself. Yeah, yeah, I think that's exactly right. Because uh, in mechanism, the, the basic definition of what makes an object is that it's independent and indifferent, right? And that is kept up throughout mechanism. That is never sort of violated. It's made use of for the organization, right? But the organization remains something separate from the things being organized. Maybe we can put it like that, right? And so that's why Hegel talks about law at the very end of mechanism, I think, because the law sort of picks out and defines the organizational element, but doesn't necessarily have to deal with the things being organized. So <laughs> the law sort of deals with the patterns, right? But what is exactly doing, like the patterns of, is not really uh, a concern for yeah. the law itself. Hey, exactly, exactly, exactly. Hi. Um, one thing it might be interesting to trace um, with this first comment about the intelligence being assumed to be the author of the purpose, uh, the purpose, the um, uh, the teleological purpose, purposiveness. Um, to what extent uh, in this section is? Um, purpose going to be guided by some intelligence uh, because that would you know at least in traditional logic potentially be a source of externality right the the divine purpose or you know purpose outside of um, a, a, you know a, a, an internal purpose to the organism um, so uh, it's I mean because because I think the answer to that's going to be that the you know, the intelligence is imminent in the concept, but uh, it would just be interesting to kind of trace that as we go along to to what extent does Hegel respond to um, or engage with the more traditional teleologies where the purpose is externalized in some, uh, you know, divine or kind of cosmic intelligence that might be separate from... Uh, um. The the thing that struck me, sorry, um, with mechanism and chemism previously when I read them, um, is just the his treatment of what what he treats in the cases that um, like uh, it's primarily sort of things like um, uh, um, solar systems and. Um, obviously chemistry and what's interesting there I think is that um, if you look at someone like Aristotle um, in Aristotle the the solar system and um, even sort of biological life or uh, what I think Hegel is discussing with chemistry um, have their own kind of um, their own purposes and their own sort of internal um logic so the the um the the heavens for for aristotle um with uh, in its sort of uh, most outermost form is moved by the unmoved mover i.e god um and that has the purpose of its own self-contemplation um and so i think it's quite interesting that um that just at the level of what he's treating um he has this movement through mechanism to um, to through through mechanism chemism teleology, and then obviously the result will be uh, the the idea, and the idea obviously is what then uh, spirit is spirit contemplates um, the idea, and that it is a to my understanding that is its like own self contemplation. Um, so I think there is an interesting element there that he is in continuity with people like Aristotle, where Aristotle um, does have this sort of um, the yeah the supreme good is philosophy self contemplation really, um, and this is most perfectly realized in that which moves the heavens, which is the unmoved mover. Um, so I think that's a, that's an interesting thing to think about, especially because he he does. 
um, it does look to me like he's attempting to show how um, final causation emerges from efficient causation. And so where, say, uh, someone like Kant would want to say that you can kind of have, um, you can have, or say uh, maybe a crude reading of Kant would say that you can have official causa efficient causation without having final causation and that this kind of final causation and purposiveness uh, it has to be assumed but cannot be proved. Um, it seems to me then that he is almost engaging in a kind of um, a proof of final causation from efficient causation, um, which I think is, is what is sort of, um, which I think is also then why he uses the language of antimony and um, in a moment sort of earlier metaphysics and so forth. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I think um, that's, it seems to be like we have two uh, positions Hegel could take. So he could go down the traditional Aristotelian route and posit an unmoved mover that is, you know, there externally and moving the heavens, which move, you know, sublunar stuff and then move planetary stuff. And so everything goes all the way down, uh, which is kind of like, seems to be what he's hinting at at the very first sentence. But when he mentions intelligence again, towards the end of the paragraph, it sounds like a different kind of intelligence to me. Intelligence that determines itself. Uh, because in the Aristotelian picture, the unmoved mover is done, it's finished, right? There's nothing, no development there. It's just, you know, it's doing its thing. It's unmoved, right? But an intelligence that determines itself would have to enter into some sort of change or development and would not, would, would by definition, have then not be external to um, the world in which it interacts. Yeah, I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense, especially with um, regards to other things that uh, he has said. But yeah, I think um, I think there's not much more to be said for the for the first paragraph. Um, yeah, I think we should, been... uh, we, should, we should press on, I think. Uh, yeah. Let's see if you want to make a short point. No, I'm, I, I was going to say I'm happy to, to read uh, if anyone else doesn't want to read. Yeah, please go on. Um, earlier metaphysics has dealt with these concepts as it deals with others. It presupposed a certain picture of the world and strives to show that one or um, the other concept of causality was adequate to it and the opposite defective because not explainable um, from the pre presupposed picture, all the while not examining the concept of mechanical cause and that of purpose to see which possesses truth in and for itself. If this is, is established independently, it may turn out that the objective world um, exhibits mechanical and final causes. Its actual existence is not the norm of what is true, but what is true is rather the criterion of deciding which of those concrete existences is its true one. Just as the subjective understanding exhibits, error, um, exhibits also errors in it, so the objective world exhibits um, also aspects and stages of truth that by themselves are still one-sided and incomplete and only relations of appearances. If mechanism and purposiveness stand opposed to one another, then by that very fact, they cannot be taken as indifferent concepts, as if um, each were by itself a correct concept and had as much validity as the other. The only question being whether one or the other may apply. This equal validity of the two rests only on the fact that they are. That is to say that we have both of them. But since they do stand opposed, the necessary first question is, which of the two concepts is the true one? And the higher truly telling question is, whether there is a third which is their truth and whether one of them is the truth of the other. But purposive connection um, has proved to be the truth of mechanism. Regarding chemism, which um, came under it, can be taken together with mechanism. For purpose is the concept in free concrete existence, the concept state of unfreedom. It is sunk into externality, stands opposed to it in any form. 
both mechanism as well as chemism are therefore included under natural necessity. Mechanism, because in it the concept does not exist in the object concretely, but as mechanical, the later lacks self-determination. Chemism, either because the concept has in it a one-sided concrete existence in a state of tension, or because emerging as the unity that creates in the natural object a tension of extremes is external to itself insofar as it sublates this divide. Um, Thanks, Adam. I mean, Peter. Yeah. Lovely bit of um, Hegelian reasoning there, by the way. You know, this yeah, idea yeah. of like, well, if you oppose them two to each other, then there is a sort of third thing that is, you know, uh, figuring out the interaction between the two, which are opposed. <laughs> I wonder what that would be. Turn up. What does can can you anyone cast the light on? Just as we've done it, so mechanism lack self-determination but came keenism uh ha, because the concept has in it a one-sided concrete existence can anybody unpack that bit because it seems as though i should know what it means and i don't and it's probably going forward quite important for purpose Um, I think what he's saying is that um, chemism is, while it is a kind of internal determination, it is related to another. Um, so it's like, I think he's arguing that there yeah, with sort of mechanical causation, the object has no self-determination, it's organized by another. Um, with chemism, it seems that he's saying that um, the there is a kind of internal purposiveness, yeah. but it is related to another, and so it's uh, semi-random, I, I think is kind of the, because it, yeah, it's the, the one-sided concrete existence in a state of tension. Um, and I think that tension would be basically with um, things that are external to the to the to the uh, chemical object uh, or the chemical whatever, and um, emerging as a unity that creates in tension of extremes is external to itself. Yeah, yeah. insofar as it splits the divide. Yeah, um, beginning to reactivate some of. So, I mean, you've got the acid base type thing, and, and in a sense, it's almost as though the acid yearns for the base to get together and neutralize and produce the salt and water and whatever. Um, yeah, so you only have a chemical object once there is a chemical process. So, a chemical yeah. process involves these different elements in some sort of relation that sublates them both, right? Yeah. process changes both elements more or less right and then produces something new um, but yeah. the organization only subsists for as long as the process itself subsists right? yeah yeah so you no longer have a chemical object i think unless there is some sort of chemical process that's attached to that which itself but, deals in oppositional terms yeah but 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 the very process actually kind of passage the chemical object as well. I think that's the kind of reason why in the end of the paragraph he says like, it's external to itself. In so far as it's sublates this divide. So I mean because in the chemical object like we have still a kind of division between the concept and the object as such, right? And their unit constitutes like, some sort of a process in which we can understand actually what the chemical object is. But 
by establishing that, that unity, we are just losing the, the, the chemical object as such. Because the chemical object in, in itself is to contain that divide of, of or between the concept and the, and the object itself. Yeah, so it's like super contradictory. Yeah. Yeah, so it's like uh, the mechanical process 2.0. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. It is quite similar in that sense. Um, by the way, my question is, it's, it's, it's about the kind of like Hegel's strategy here. Okay, so the earlier metaphysics um, has done some terrible job in terms of reading the world as if it comes from one cause to another. So the understanding just fixates on one cause and tries to understand the world. Therefore, like it basically reduces the world to a some known causes, right? And Hegel says it is not the right thing to do because it basically leaves aside some other truths about the uh, truths about the, 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 the objective world or the reality. Um, so what is his strategy then? So like kind of like accommodating the the chemical um, um, and mechanical and teleological explanations under 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 a kind of umbrella term or something. I was um, Mark. So the question is basically so like I mean in the very beginning of the paragraph he criticizes the earlier metaphysics right by being not capable of explaining the world in its totality. In its totality, what I mean is basically just like uh, in its chemical or or mechanical or teleological uh, aspect because it basically just holds on to uh, one or the other cause try to explain things and and and, and they just leave aside the other types of the world or other aspects of the world. Um, and he says like here, for instance, it may turn out that the objective world exhibits mechanical and final causes. Because the earlier metaphysics just wants to see the world in terms of its, its mechanical or the causal ends or the causal, how say, expressions. Because the only way to understand the world for the earlier metaphysics like Aristotle, for instance, is just to understand the cause of things. The cause of things gives us the prime mover, but the cause of things gives us the why things are in the way that they are, and so on and so forth. But Hegel, I think, is not on board with that idea. Because he thinks that there's something else um, else than explaining the world causally or mechanically. So I just didn't understand from this paragraph that, okay, the earlier metaphysics is wrong. Metaphysics is wrong. Okay, I accept that. Because it cannot explain the whole world. Because the whole world is not reducible to the cause relations, right? Um, but what is his, what's his strategy? Uh, I don't understand that. I, I find it quite confusing to be honest. So it happens, his suggestion I think happens in the kind of um, the part that comes with the kind of italics or the very end of the page 61, 651. Uh, the, but since the two that they're joined in a third, um, I think what he seems to be, um, if, you, if you read the, I don't know how much of the um, history of philosophy you, you've read, but one of the big things that he, he, he very much hates with, that he finds um, kind of laughable in, in the earlier metaphysics of, um, especially Wolf and the, the Cambridge Platonists, um, is their separation of different type of different things. Um, so he, there's a line where he, he says something to the effect of, um, uh, and they reduce everything to God and the angels. Um, and so the, what he, what he, what I think he's objecting to with this kind of, um, especially in this whole section where he says, um, if mechanism and purposiveness stand opposed to one another, then by that very fact, they cannot be taken as in different concepts. Um, I think if you connect this with his earlier point about the opposition between um, efficient and final causation, um, what I think he's going to, to show or try to, to show, especially as you see with this point about uh, uh, where, whether there is um, a third, which is their truth or whether one of them is the truth of the other is that you can't take um, efficient causation without a consideration of final causation of, of purposiveness and that you can't take a consideration of purposiveness 
without at first without first considering mechanical causation um and so i think that's sort of what how i understand it of that he's kind of saying that if you um i think this is where he's very spinozistic is that he wants to he wants to show how um you can't just have these kinds of you know all these independent categories or all these independent concepts there has to be some kind of underlying unity that um that joins all of them together and that um and that further these kind of what he sort of objects to in in say spinoza is is that the consideration of these of these concepts separate from that from what underlies them and so what i think he'll show especially um if we consider the whole of the movement of uh that he first considers subjectivity and then objectivity um you know section uh, in the subjective logic it's first subjectivity judgment so forth then it's objectivity and then um then he considers the uh, the idea and so i think what he will attempt to show is that even in this concept of efficient causation as like externality you have you have to have this purposiveness and thus freedom um basically um yeah so that, that's sort of my that's what i think mm. that's what i think he's trying to do and i think it's um yeah i think it is basically trying to show how um yeah that, that's i think where where it is um well, okay he's being aristotelian then right i mean like from the efficient cause we are just going to the final cause in a sense or he believes that like efficient causes take us to the final cause in the end um hey i i, I um yeah, anyway it's, 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 it's not like how say a question that is quite related to the text to be honest anyway mm -hmm. let's leave it to the yeah. historians of philosophy mm -hmm. yeah yeah um i'll continue reading the closer the teleological principle is associated um, peter i'm oh, sorry sorry could i interrupt you like yeah i think we we should like rotate uh, so okay. that everybody okay. get a chance gets a chance to okay. say something in sessions uh that's all right with you all right cheers uh and maria would you like to read the next section Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Okay. The closer the teleological principle is associated with the concept of an extra mundane intelligence, and the more it has therefore enjoyed the favor of piety, all the more it has seemed to depart from the true investigation of nature, which aims at the cognition of the properties of nature, not as extraneous, but as immanent determin determinacies and accepts only such cognition as a valid conceptual comprehension. Since purpose is the concept itself in its concrete existence, it may seem strange that the cognition of objects based on their concept rather appears as, a, as an unjustified trespass into a heterogeneous element, whereas mechanism for which the term, determinateness of an object is posited in it externally and by another is accepted as a more immanent view of things than teleology. Of course, mechanism, at least the ordinary unfree mechanism, and chemis as well, must be regarded as an immanent principle insofar as the externally determining object is itself against as another such object externally determined, different to its being determined, or in the case of chemism, insofar as the other object must likewise be one that is chemically determined. determined. In general, insofar as an essential moment of the totality always lies, in, uh, in general, insofar as an essential moment of the totality always lies in something external. These principles remain confined, therefore, within the same natural form of finitude. But although they do not wish to transcend the finite, 
and as regards appearances, lead only to final causes that themselves demand further causes, they nonetheless equally expand themselves partly into a formal totality in the concept of force, cause, or of such determinations of reflections of, of reflection that are supposed to signify originariness, and partly through the medium of abstract universality, also into the into a sum total of forces, a whole of reciprocal causes. Mechanism thus reveals itself to be a striving for totality by the very fact that it seeks to comprehend nature by itself as a whole, that has no need for another for its concept, a totality that is not found in purpose and the extra mundane intelligence associated with it. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> By the way, am I right to understand this whole paragraph as, as, as a thing that like telling us how not to do philosophy? In a sense, like I mean, not, it's, very, it's very general. I mean, not how, how not to do philosophy, but how not to do, how not to use the mechanism or the, 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 the causal relations. Yeah, I think that's partly it. Yeah, right. Because I mean, the, the picture he gives, is, I mean, seems to me very Aristotelian. And towards the end of the paragraph, you mean the picture? The picture we should not do yeah exactly yes exactly yeah. because because i think he, he wants us if we do that then we are kind of asserting a some totality of causes that no other concept is needed to understand the world and in the previous part of you already said that if we just understand the world as the totality of causes then it's problematic because it misses some other aspects of the world like the chemism and so on and so forth um, yeah and because like what is that totality of causes yep as he says that that become morphed into another kind of concept, like such as force, cause, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting. There is like a flip here in in terms of like um, uh, with regards to mechanism and teleology. Um, flip, like in, in what sense? You mean like from transition from one to another to a kind of opposition or what do you mean? Yeah, so it's the sentence, it may seem strange that a cognition of objects based on their concept rather appears as an unjustified trespass into a heterogeneous element, right? So mm -hmm. a purpose is not supposed to be heterogeneous, it's supposed mm -hmm. to be, you know, more intimate, connect, more intimately connected to the thing's concept. Yep. Right? Whereas in the traditional, you know, extra mundane intelligence view, then that's exactly the opposite of what happens. It makes a bigger divide. And then it continues, whereas mechanism, for which the term is an object is posited externally and by another, is accepted as a more imminent view of things than teleology, right? So teleology is logically meant to, uh, you know, be the more imminent view, and yet, uh, like ordinarily, mechanism is the one. It's kind of a flip <laughs> that happens. Very I interesting. Guess. I agree, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so far, we have no clue what teleology is, right? We haven't <laughs> started properly. No, teleology. Teleology. Yeah. We're just getting uh, teasers and trailers. One interesting uh, bit about the the fact that mechanism um uh is is regarded as more imminent but you know hegel is saying that it's in fact a, a external because the object is conditioned by another object if you just look externally at the mechanist or sorry if you just look historically at the the mechanistic um sort of scientific account of the world 
it um, you know it, it begins with this empirical science, or it begins with this empirical observation based approach, and then you know as it seeks to explain how this force conditions that force, it ends up in something external, like the deist god, right, like the Newtonian uh, prime mover and so forth. I think he's uh, also kind of responding, he's kind of noting that irony, right, that uh, you begin with this attempt to, you know, it kind of reminds me a bit of the play of forces in the phenomenology with, you know, you begin to try to map out what these forces are doing mechanistically, and then you end up, all you can do is kind of separate them out from the object because you can't um, you know, fully realize them with the, the kind of conceptual resources of mechanism. Um, and uh, yeah, and this kind of directly responds to what I was saying at the beginning about uh, the extra mundane intelligence, the fact that, you know, generally purpose uh, is, is an externality. So it will be interesting to see how he maneuvers purpose into being um, more imminent in this way. Yeah, and uh, this loops back into the beginning of um, the previous paragraph, where it seems to me that what Hegel is primarily complaining about is that nobody is investigating the categories they're employing in and for themselves. So, like, uh, you know, why do we start with mechanism? Why is that one the favored one? Or why is teleology, uh, the external mundane intelligence, the one favored, right? So I think the play of forces and and Phenomenology is a good, uh, good example of this, where you sort of keep on positing stuff, but then you end up with this absolutely necessary being that is wholly detached from the process of which it is supposed to ground, right? Okay, I suggest we, uh, we press on. Uh, it would be really nice if we could get the introduction finished today, so that we're good for the meet of the text uh, next time. So uh, George, would you like to read the next uh, paragraph? Yeah, I, I don't know that I have the same edition as everyone in front of me, but... Uh, we have the Miller one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we, we've had this thing before and it's usually not a problem. Yeah. Okay. Now, per, um, purposiveness um, shows itself in the first instance as a higher being in general, as an intelligence that externally determines the multiplicity of objects by a unity that exists in and for itself, so that the indifferent determinateness, uh, determinatenesses of the objects become essential through this relation. In mechanism, they become so thorough, they become so through the mere form of necessity, their content being indifferent, for they are supposed to remain external, and it is only understanding as such that it is supposed to find fa uh, satisfaction in cognizing its own connective principle, abstract identity. In teleology, on the contrary, the content becomes important, for teleology presupposes a notion, something absolutely determined and therefore self-determining, and so has made a distinction between the relation of the differences and their reciprocal determinedness determinedness that is the form and the unity that is reflected into itself, a unity that is determined in and for itself and therefore a content. But when the content is otherwise a finite and insignificant one, it contradicts what is supposed, what is supposed to be for, uh, for end according to its form, is a totality infinite within itself, especially when the activity that operates in accordance with ends is assumed to be an absolute will and intelligence. The reason why teleology has incurred so much the reproach of triviality is that the ends it exhibited are more important or more trivial, as the case may be, and it was inevitable that the end relation of objects should so often appear trifling, since it appears to be so external and therefore contingent. Mechanism, on the contrary, leaves to, de to the determinateness of objects, as regards their import, their contingent status, to which the object is indifferent. And these determinatenesses are not supposed to have, either for the objects or for subjective intelligence, any higher validity. 
This principle, therefore, in its context of external necessity, gives the consciousness of infinite freedom as compared with teleology, which sets up for something absolute, what is trivial, and even contemptible in its content, in which the more universal thought can only find itself infinitely cramped and even feel disgusted. Thanks, George. Um, it's interesting here because it, it seems that what he's pointing to is that um, there has been this kind of uh, reversal, almost, that like, um, that mechanism in many ways has taken on the properties of what he thinks should probably be assigned to teleology. So um, obviously you see this, especially in the last paragraph where he says that um, this principle combined with external necessity yields therefore a consciousness of infinite freedom that contrasts with teleology. That when you, basically I think what he's saying is that when you conceive of teleology of purposes and as ends external to it to an object um that it is um that it seems then to be a kind of um like a, a, a almost like a prison or, or something uh, contemptible where this view of of mechanism pure externality um allows you to think that you are freer in some sense um, than what teleology has allowed um, and he, that's that's quite interesting that he he seems to that he I think what he's trying to 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 push for is the concept almost of imminent ends that that um, teleology purposiveness is not um, not a not a yeah it's not super mundane almost um, like it's not um yeah purposiveness presents from itself as something of a generally higher nature uh, as it says in the giovanni um as an intelligent that externally determines the manifoldness of objects um and it's interesting then that in in this translation that is connected with um essence um that he he connects this with which I think is quite interesting that, that um, because uh, in, in the doctrine of essence, he often complains about like argument from grounds and from essences and so forth. Um, so I think there's an interesting connection there that, um, that, he, that seems to have been a reversal that he sees in, in uh, or a reversal of, of the true concept of teleology to um, a false concept or a false conception. I think the section also has a maybe a bit of a good answer to the question earlier about you know how is he trying to have both mechanism and causality um I think the answer is in part uh, or sorry both mechanism and teleology or both the final cause and the efficient cause um I think the answer um is you know you, uh, you, you you can have both i mean you need to have both because they have this as we've been saying you know uh, he's trying to move from the uh, uh, efficient cause to the final cause or see them in their interrelation but also um you it, it, it's ultimately related to the concept, right? So it's it's kind of moments within the concept. So the mechanism isn't false, right? It's not like mechanism is wrong. It's just a, um, uh, it's not the full instantiation of the concept, right? It's not the full realization. It's not the full development of the concept, right? Um, I mean, it's like you could, like, I mean, uh, uh, you could take something that has a, a teleological logic, like uh, 
an organ, right, uh, in a body, and treat it mechanistically, right? You can uh, you can perform mechanics upon it, right? It's not it's uh, it's uh, you know determined by the laws of mechanics, but that's not it's um, that's not it's uh, kind of conceptual uh, reality. It's uh, a mechanical reality that through which and in which the conceptual reality uh, is realized. But um, uh, yeah, the um, the final, uh, I mean, and, and that's why he's holding this goal for teleology as, you know, we can't have teleology as, um, you know, this kind of trivial externality where, you know, the, the, the world of mechanism, the world of, uh, you know, kind of, uh, um, scientific empirical being just becomes this appendage, right? I, I see a lot of the kind of like deistic clockwork God in that he's quite fond of criticizing them, right? It's just like, well, you know, the, you know, the, this real world was only um, kind of secondary to this uh, higher purpose that is detached from it. Yeah, the higher purpose isn't so high if it needs the secondary stuff to do, you know, it's dirty work. Just a small uh, uh, translation thing. So, in the Miller, the word is end, and in, um, in the teleology, I mean, in uh, Di Giovanni, it's, he, he translates purpose, but the German word is Zweck. <laughs> And looking at you know dictionaries, it usually is translated into purpose. So you should think, I, in terms of like you know something is being done for the reason of something else, right? As you and George were saying, like you example using an example like organs, right? They are there for some purpose, right? The liver is there, for, you know, cleaning up blood and getting out toxins and so forth, right? And it's part of a bigger whole, but. Um, yeah, and we should not be jumping ahead and thinking in terms of like final ends or final purposes. You know, far away. Uh, and just a question, actually. So, I mean, like, uh, the kind of like, principle governing our talk here is basically the, so far, the belief or an assumption that Hegel's teleology is not something external, but it's kind of inner determination of things, right? And I think everyone is on board with this idea, and I am too. But Hegel doesn't explain it so far. So, my question is basically, uh, what's the problem with the external purposiveness? What's the problem with the external theology here? I mean, if I, like, have the assumption that theology should be something in there then whatever he's saying here makes sense actually because i have the assumption in mind so i know where he's gonna go uh but the thing is since we don't have that conception so far at least if you read the text strictly well it, it, it does well i think i think the main issue with external theology is that it presupposes a fully formed concept like ready to go Right, whether it's in the form of a you know a god that you know is, is there or unmoved mover, like mm -hmm. it's it's finished and developed, right? Uh, and so everything is already there. I I think also it. Um, I think uh, George was mentioning about. Uh, the deistic clockmaker. I think the other problem that he would have is that it actually, this concept of um, external ends ends up confusing mechanism and teleology. Where if you, if you conceive of, um, if you conceive of purposes as external to the object, um, what you're basically saying is that an object is um, conditioned by something outside of itself. Um, and that is basically just mechanism. Um, and so I think the, what he's kind of, and I think that's why he's, he's 
why I think he's connected um, to to why I think he does this like switch where you know where it says well, uh, the switch that he he see he seems to indicate has happened or or um, has happened in the history of philosophy um, that like determinism in a certain sense gives you freedom in a way that um, uh, this kind of external teleology, external whatever, um, doesn't is because what what it kind of does is I think it has a kind of mechanism in a certain sense acts prior to something. So if you have this kind of outside determination, um, I think at least from what, what I'm reading and what sort of I, uh, I'm thinking, I'm not sure if I would agree here. Um, the, mechanis the mechanistic view is ultimately stuff prior. And so there is, in a certain strange way, there is a kind of freedom that, that comes from this mechanistic picture that um, causation as, or final, uh, sorry, teleology as something, um, as something outside of the self and uh, in the future doesn't give, that you're kind of compelled to towards something in the future. Um, basically, that it, I think it would then, it introduces a kind of mechanism, uh, it introduces mechanistic views both in the past and in the future. Um, and then I think that is is what he sees as constraining infinite, yeah, um, where the more universal thought can only find itself infinitely constricted, even to the point of feeling disgust or nauseated. Is the as the is it the Miller? Yeah, the Miller um, says. So, so I think that's that. I think is what is wrong with this kind of um, external external teleology. Yes, that, absolutely. That's definitely one thing that's oppressive about teleology and why so many people, philosophers included, are like, you know, uh, disgusted by it because it feels as if, you know, things are already determined ahead of, ahead of themselves. Right? Uh, but then the question is, okay, if, if something else is determined ahead of itself, well, what determined that ahead of the de determining it, right? So if there is an external intelligence that's determining things, then what determined that external intelligence? Right. And you know, you can keep going down that way. Um, I see a lot of people have joined us just now. I uh, suspect that maybe uh, the time was um, misunderstood or something. So we've been going on for an hour already to, to everybody who's joining us now. Thank you for joining. Um, we're um, we're actually just like three pages in, so we haven't missed out on much. Uh, and we are reading an introduction to the chapter on teleology and pages uh, 653 in the Di Giovanni or um, the Academ Academy, Academy, the edition is uh, 12.156. Uh, Yeah, and the way the format works is that we read a paragraph and then we discuss it and try to figure it out. So this is how we did it. Uh, 3pm, was the, which time zone was uh, stipulated? It's German time. I don't know what it is. Yeah, I think it's be UTC plus two or something. Yes, that's a German time, 3 p.m. 2 p.m. UK time. Yep. And, and whatever else is. <clears throat> Who would like to read? Any volunteers? Who? Read? I'm, I'm willing to volunteer, but. <laughs> Michaela Baudignon, would you like to read? Good that you, good, to, good of you to join us, by the way.
Uh, I can't hear you. No, still nothing. I think your your mic somewhere is, is not turned on on the computer. Yeah, still nothing. Okay. Um, would does anyone else want to? Happy to read. Okay, Bill, go ahead. The formal disadvantage from which this teleology immediately suffers is that it only goes as far as external purposiveness. The content of concept, since the latter is thereby posited as something formal, is for teleology also externally given to it in the manifoldness of the objective world. In those very determinacies, that are also the content of mechanism, but are there as something external and accidental. Because of this commonality of content, only the form of purposiveness constitutes by itself the essential element of the teleological. In this respect, without as yet considering the distinction between external and internal, purposiveness, the connection of purpose is general, in general, has proven itself to be the truth of mechanism. Teleology possesses in general the higher principle, the concepts in its concrete existence, which is in and for itself the infinite and absolute, a principle of freedom which utterly certain of its self-determination is absolutely withdrawn from the external determining of mechanism. Do you want to take the next one too, Bill? This is a yep. short paragraph. Thanks. One of Kant's greatest services to philosophy was in drawing the distinction between relative or external purposiveness and internal purposiveness. In the latter, he opened up the concept of life, the idea, and with that he positively raised philosophy above the determinations of reflection and the relative world of metaphysics, something that the critique of reason does only imperfect, imperfectly, ambiguously, and only negatively. We have remarked that the opposition of teleology and mechanism is first of all the general opposition of freedom and necessity. Kant treated the opposition in this form, among the antinomies of reason, namely as the third conflict of the transcendental ideas. I cite his exposition to which reference was made earlier, very briefly because its essential point is so simple but it does not need extensive explanation. And moreover, the peculiarity of Kant's antinomies have been elucidated in greater detail elsewhere. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. So Kant is uh, entering the picture. And uh, he's, you know, <laughs> Hegel is just both praising him and uh, slapping him at, at the same time. First, so the first paragraph I read is, is Hegel, I think, of advancing some dis key distinctions. And then there's about a page or so on, on Kant, I think, to come. Um, so I'm not sure I got a lot from the Kant, but, but that first paragraph seems quite important. I mean, he makes the external internal distinction very clearly there. It's almost as if he's collapsing um, external purposiveness with external determining. And so external purposiveness is kind of like a you know, just a rehash of mechanism. 
that beard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. So it so it wouldn't really be teleology in, in Hegel's understanding. Mm -hmm. I think it's for the reason, like for the this reason, I think he says this is truth of mechanism. So I mean, it's not only like I mean, mechanism proves itself to be teleology, but that very false understanding of teleology is also already mechanism or mechanistic. Mechanism reaches for teleology, but it, uh, it, it and that's why it's the truth of mechanism is the purpose, um, but it uh, doesn't fully internalize it, right? It doesn't fully grasp it, right? Uh, to use the, you know, the, the griff, the, the concept, it's not, it doesn't belong to mechanism proper. No, because then we have to leave mechanism behind, you know, to step over there. Yeah. And then these bits about freedom and uh, uh, necessity, right? The, you know, because because Hegel wants to preserve both freedom and necessity, uh, you you kind of uh, you move between freedom and necessity um, by moving between externality and internality, right? So so freedom is inner necessity, right? It's uh, um, you know uh, the the logic of necessity has been. Uh, sublated into uh, you know an internal purpose right or an internal uh, goal so it's uh, the inner the inner outer distinction is really quite crucial to understanding all this because um, insofar as necessity remains external then you know you're an unfreedom right but you know freedom also isn't uh, you know kind of random action it's uh you know action towards a purpose an inner purpose um which is you know teleology properly understood I agree. hi guys are you hearing me yep no, okay I'm... great <laughs> sorry for, first of all sorry of uh be, uh, being late it's just that i put the uk time so maybe that was i arrived when i was late <laughs> um, uh, um this passage seems a little bit um, ambiguous for me because uh on the one hand uh, uh it seems to me that hegel was trying to highlight the specificity of uh teleology if compared with uh, um mechanism and chemism. On the other hand, uh, when he puts Kant in the scene, hmm, it seems that he's trying to uh, trace back uh, external teleology to mechanism. Hmm? Uh, so it is a kind of trick to me. Uh, but I think that teleology, uh, external, still uh, external teleology has a specificity if compared with, uh, 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 with mechanism. Hmm? because it seems to um, put uh, uh, a focus uh, on the fact that we have uh, an um, universal that subsumes a particular. So it seems to incorporate, to embody the structure uh, of the concept, uh, the absolute form of the concept in a, so to say, truer way. Uh, but he does this move when he puts Kant into the scene. It seems to uh, put external theology closer to mechanism. That's why, for me, it seems to be a little bit um, ambiguous. Uh, but I, I don't know if I got it right. <laughs> yeah, I think I see what you mean, Michaela. That. Uh because uh, external purposiveness is still purposiveness, but it's still pur it still deals with purpose, and so it's, uh, it's a way in which something self-organizing, self-determining is taking bits and incorporating it into itself, right? And so it shouldn't just be reduced back into mechanism. Is that what the yeah, thought is? But I guess um, um, we'll, we, should be get, we should get clear all, about all that when we get into the logic proper.
Uh, I propose we we press press on. I I worry that we won't be able to finish the introduction today. But that's okay. You know, you know we'll we'll keep on going for as long as it takes. So, Michaela, would you like to uh, do give us the cant? Okay. Uh, uh, it starts with the thesis of the antinomies, right? That it's the point where we are. That's right. Yes. Okay. The thesis of the antinomy now in question runs thus causality according to the laws of nature is not the only one from which the appearance of the world can exhaustively be derived. For the explanation, it is necessary to assume yet another causality through freedom. The antithesis, uh, there is no freedom, but everything in the world that happens solely according to the laws of nature. As in the other antinomies, uh, the proof starts off uh, apagogically uh, by assuming the opposite of its thesis. Accord, uh, secondly, in order to show the contradiction of this assumption, the op its opposite, which is then the proposition to be proved, is assumed in turn and presupposed as valid. This whole roundabout proof could uh, therefore be spared, for the proof consists in nothing but the assertoric assertion of the two opposite propositions. Uh, thus, to prove the thesis, uh, uh, we should first assume that there is no other causality than that according to the law of nature, that is according to the necessity of mechanism in general, chemism being included. Um, this proposition contradicts itself because the law of nature consists just in this, that nothing happens without a cause sufficiently determined a priori. Um, a cause that would have to contain an absolute spontaneity within it, that is, the assumption opposed to the thesis is contradictory for the reason that it contradicts the thesis. I go on? Do I go on? Yeah, do another one. Okay. In support of the proof of the antithesis, we should assume that there is a freedom um, as a particular kind of causality for absolutely initiating a situation and together with it, also a series of consequences following, up, uh, following upon it. But now, since such a beginning presupposes a situation that has no causal link with the one preceding it, it contradicts the law of causality. That alone makes the unity of experience and experience in general possible. That is, the assumption of the freedom that is opposed to the antithesis cannot be made for the reason that it contradicts the antithesis. Do I stop here? Yeah, please do. Thank you, Michael. Okay. I guess maybe the first question we should be asking is Hegel being fair to Kant here? <laughs> I mean, he, he does this quite often that he he um, criticizes the way that Kant presents the 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 um, paradoxes or like antimonies of reason. Um, I think at one point he says that uh, the paradoxes of the Eletics are far higher and sort of uh, better presented than than. Can't um, and I, I think I mean that that the question of is he being fair to Kant I think is is um, not necessarily the 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 issue at hand I think um, the the question should more be what is his attitude towards Kant and it it seems to me that he thinks that. Uh, Kant has hit upon a real problem here, 
but that Khan has sort of done it almost unknowingly in a way. Uh, so like he, he says that, uh, as it, somewhere he says some, uh, that they, he merely sort of demonstrates them by assertion. Um, so then he's kind of just shy, like Kant is just doing this, like he's, Kant has hit on something real, but he's hit on it by way of like pure dogma, basically, is, is, is Hegel's view. Um, if that's a fair assessment of Kant, I think is, is less important than what it says about his, Hegel's view of Kant, um, would be my view. I suppose I think there's any, there isn't any problem with that reading to balance of Hegel against Kant because I mean isn't that the point in antinomy is that he I mean Kant deals with the some dogmatic assumptions of the pre no early metaphysics so like there's freedom no there's causality and so on and so forth so you know in order to show that the, their thesis are kind of nonsense just he's he's just dealing with their assumptions so I mean he has to assume something from them in that respect I guess. But I think the Hegelian way of reading is, is basically, I think the, the passage you were referring was here. He said, Hegel says that the, the proof starts off apologically by assuming the opposite of each thesis. So that's the kind of Kantian trick probably Kant wouldn't be aware, but he doesn't need to be aware, to be honest. Because it is the, the mere purpose of antinomies, right? The mere function of antinomies, assuming that each position in the history of philosophy arguing the opposite thesis. And if we consider them, then they would end up in a kind of contradiction. So I think that the dissecting of antinomy is here um, done by Hegel. I think it's quite appropriate. I don't know. I, I don't see like the, any, a kind of any particular problem here, actually. I don't know, but Stephen Hawke had a particular problem with another antinomy. I don't remember which one now. And he was arguing that the Hegel is kind of doing um, some sort of like unfair job of assuming that the Kant was thinking something in another antinomy, but it was kind of wrong and so on and so forth. I don't know the details, but anyway, so there could be something wrong in Hegel's uh, reading of Kant too. But I think here, as far as he goes with this so far, there doesn't seem any problem to be honest, to me at least, I don't know. Mm. Well, you know, to defend Kant, one could say, like, it, it's important that we have these two assumptions and they both lead into their opposites, because that is what the antinomy is, right? You have to have these two things that are going up at the same time. So it's not just, you can't just reduce them to two um, two sort of assertions. Mm -hmm. No, no, there is, a two, there is a two independent assertions that lead into each other. That's really what's what's making it the antinomy. So it's the kind of this dual sided thing. So uh, if you take that, take this process and this development away from it, then you lose the sense of antinomy in the camp. Exactly. Yeah. Um, another thing we should uh, keep bear in mind here is like, I take a talking about this. <laughs> We've suddenly moved into freedom and necessity, right? We were talking about purpose and, and stuff. I don't think we uh, we will have to. I think read a bit more, but it's uh, good to keep in mind. Like, why is this being brought up? At this point? I mean, isn't uh, no, no. why do you think it's brought up? Though? Do you have any idea? I think he, I think he brings up the antimonies um, because I think he, the common, sort of the common ordinary conception um, is that there is an, an, that there is an opposition between freedom and necessity. Um, and I think what he wants to show is that there is not uh, an opposition or that there is or that freedom properly conceived um sublates or overcomes necessity um and that i think that's why he connects this discussion of teleology mechanism 
freedom necessity with the antimonies. And I think that's also why he says uh, that uh, that he starts starts off ap um, apopogically, whatever, um, this whole roundabout proof could therefore be spared for the proof consists in nothing but the assertoric assertion of two opposite propositions. Because I think what he wants to show is that underlying those two propositions uh, is a false conception of um, a false conception of freedom and necessity, and that what Kant has has uh, rendered to to philosophy, uh, the service that he has rendered to philosophy, is in demonstrating the falsity of these two conceptions uh, of the of the of the one conception of these two things. Um, and how, when connected with a higher conception, which I think uh, he will show to be the concept um, and and sort of teleology, not merely as external purpose, but as internal purpose, um, that that concept is um, resolves these these apparent um, apparent antimonies. Mm. That would be my reading, at least, of why he discusses this. I I agree with Peter uh, because an interesting thing is that uh, the Hegel does not have any problem with the antinomies. Quite the contrary, he <laughs> loves the antinomies. Uh, basically, the result of the chapter will be this, the same result of the antinomies. It's just that uh, at the end. Uh, Don't spoil uh, it, Michela. Uh, what? Don't spoil it, Michela. <laughs> Everyone knows. <laughs> it's just that he shows that this contradiction does not... Uh, there is, of course, a contradiction, but the, the contradiction just highlights uh, um, or oh, um, shows uh, the one-sidedness of the view according to which there is an opposition between the two determinations. But actually, it shows that that contradiction according to which uh, uh, the external propositiveness uh, shows to be in itself, to contain in itself the internal purposiveness is actually what it, a spoiler alert, is <laughs> what will happen uh, next. And it is a, a pagogic, <laughs> uh, uh, it's an internal, uh, it's an uh, internal derivation uh, from one category to, to its opposite. Uh, so is using Kant to do to do uh, to do show, to show the same result Kant shows with the antinomies, but uh, ascribing the result a different value. What he always that is what what he always does with the antinomies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, another thing is that this is the first place I think in the logic where we actually do have freedom and necessity put side by side. Like nowhere in the logic do we have we had the two, like contrasted each other. Uh, like we still don't even have it in the logic. We we have it here in the introduction with regards to Kant. But um, so, in at the end of essence, necessity turns into freedom. Right, turns into the concept. But then the concept turns into mechanism, which is kind of a form of necessity. Right, and so we have a sense in which necessity turns into freedom and freedom turns into necessity, but we don't have the two side by side. I'm wondering if this is something that occurs in the chapter on teleology. Well, in order to have them in opposition to each other, we need to assert a kind of a concept of freedom and a concept of necessity. I think they emerge here in opposition only because like he's talking about Kant and Kant is assuming that there are that already kind of historical positions. So there's like an idea of freedom or an idea of necessity in the history. And he talks about them in, in his antinomies, right? Yeah, yeah. but Hegel's but, 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 but Hegel's gotta have, 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 have to have to give a logical, his logical version of that mm -hmm. of that tension, which probably yeah. will involve different terms, but, uh, but it's gonna be, he has to kind of, um, how do you say, uh, reenact mm -hmm. this, historical dilemma within the logic. Does it do? Oh, okay, I don't know. I don't think it's going to happen. I mean, I, I, I've never read closer to be honest, these chapters, but I don't think like he opposes strictly. I mean, you know much better than I could 
possibly ever, ever know. But like, um, I'm just assuming that he wouldn't want to oppose freedom and necessity in anywhere in the logic. Because um, the way he understands necessity is not exactly it's understood in the history of philosophy, really. It's something external, for instance. No, it's not external in Hegel. There is an external necessity, of course, but like it is kind of like governed by the principles of contingency. Um, so it's not the true necessity. So but um, for instance, when he says like the unfree mechanism is necessary. So what he means by the uh, an object is externally determined by another object, of course, it's necessary, but it is contingently necessary. So it is external, or it is external, therefore it's contingently necessary. So it's not the true necessity in that sense. Um, I don't know, maybe like I'm misreading necessity and freedom as such in Hegel, but anyway. Peter, you want to jump in? I, I, was, I was going to say, um, I do think he will oppose freedom and necessity at some point because very often what he does is that he will um, oppose two different things, say, um, for example, form and content, um, so as to sublate, um, as so as to overcome this opposition. Um, and so I think he, it would be strange to me if he doesn't at some point go through and say freedom without necessity would be like, um, would not be freedom. It would be sort of pure arbitrary, whatever, or, um, or necessity without freedom would be sort of equally not necessary almost would be my thought because I think there is, um, at least from sort of what I know of like um, in the in the history of philosophy and a lot of people that he's drawing on, there is this concept that to be free uh, is to be rational. And so there is a kind of necessity in freedom that um, if, and I, I think that he will, I'm not, obviously I'm not sure, but I think if he doesn't, that there would be some element to which freedom is not, um, there would be, basically you would, you would not actually resolve the contradiction between freedom and necessity if you just left freedom here and necessity here and you didn't involve them. And I think that involvement would ne necessarily involve some kind of overcoming of prior false conceptions of um, necessity and freedom. In, in such a way that would actually preserve the truth of those prior conceptions of of of, um, of freedom and necessity. I agree. I agree. Yeah, it's I think that's exactly right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in, in this respect, like Hegel is getting a little bit closer to Spinoza as well. Actually, you know, I mean, Spinoza's substance is also free, but yet it is necessary too. Or, I mean, put it better way, um, it is free because it is necessary. Because if anything is unnecessary or is not necessary then it could be determined by something other but substance is the only thing that determines itself therefore it's free and unnecessary so i think hegel is kind of how's he playing the same card here not here but like in general in his specific treatment of um, necessity and the other parts of the logic i guess um just uh, administration matter so we've set the time to uh uh from uh, like a one and a half hour session. But um, I'm willing to carry on a little bit longer, maybe 20, 25 minutes, since uh, some of you came in an hour later, then again, keep on going this one time. And also we are in the middle of a good discussion, I think. So what do people think? Should we, uh, should we press on a little bit more? Do people have time? 30 more minutes, right? Yeah, it's like 25 more minutes. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'm happy. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay, let's do that then. Any further comments on the, what we just read or should we read on? I think we should read on. Okay. Any uh, volunteers? Any takers? The juicy paragraph coming up. More on Kant.
I'd be happy to read just if um, that's okay. Gonzalo, Audrey, anyone else in, who hasn't said anything yet would like to? Uh, hello. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity for uh, hearing uh, you. Uh, sorry, today I don't have the science of logic in English translation. I only have in Spanish. Uh, I and search this paragraph must maybe is the second observation about the antinomies of Kant uh, but uh, sorry today I I don't have the, the material for discussing with you but uh, I want to listen to your conversation and try uh, after that uh, comment anything else. All right. Audrey, would you like to read? All right, that's okay. Uh, Adam, you haven't said anything in a while. Sure, I'll read. Um, we find, in essence, the same antinomy in the critique of the teleological judgment as the opposition between the proposition that every generation of material things happens according to merely mechanical laws and the proposition that some cases of generation of material things are not possible according to such laws. Kant's resolution of this antinomy is the same as the general resolution of the rest, namely that reason cannot prove either the one or the other proposition because we cannot have a priori uh, any determining principle of the possibility of things according to merely empirical laws of nature. Further, that therefore the two propositions must be regarded not as objective propositions, but as subjective maxims, that I ought to reflect on the events of nature every time according to uh, the principle of the mechanism of nature alone, but that this does not prevent, um, when occasion permits, following up certain natural uh, forms in accordance with another maxim, namely in accordance with the principle of final causes. As of now, these two maxims, uh, which moreover are supposed to be necessary only for human reason, did not stand in the same opposition as the two propositions in antinomy. Missing in all this, as we remarked above, is the one thing uh, that alone is of philosophical interest, namely the investigation of which of the two principles has truths uh, and for itself, in and for itself, sorry. On this standpoint, it makes no difference whether uh, the principle should be regarded as objective which means here as externally existing determinations of nature, or as mere maxims of a subjective cognition. What is subjective here is rather the contingent cognition that applies one or the other maxim as, it's, uh, as occasion demands. Indeed, according to whether it deems them fitting or uh, forgiven objects, but for the rest does not ask about the truth of these determinations themselves, whether they both are determinations of the objects or of cognition. I'm not sure if I jumped a paragraph somewhere, but I think you got the idea. Thanks, Adam. I wonder if we should read one more paragraph because I felt that wasn't much. Uh substantive said in this should, should I read on? Yeah, please read the next one. However unsatisfactory uh, is for this reason Kant's discussion of the teleological principle with respect to its essential viewpoint still worthy of note is the place that Kant assigns to it. 
um, since he ascribes to it a reflective faculty of judgment, he makes it into a mediating link between the universal of reason and the singular of intuition. Further, he distinguishes this reflective judgment from the determining judgment. The latter one that merely subsumes the particular under the universal. Such a universal that only subsumes an abstraction that becomes concrete only in another, in the particular. Purpose, on the contrary, is the concrete universal containing within itself the moment of particularity and of externality. It is therefore active and the impulse to repel itself from itself. The concept as purpose is of course an objective judgment in which one determination, the subject, namely the concrete concept, is self-determined while the other is not only a predicate but external objectivity. But for that reason, the connection of purpose is not a reflective judgment that considers external objects only according to a unity, as though an intelligence had given us, uh, had given them to us for the convenience of our faculty of cognition. On the contrary, it is the truth that exists in and for itself and judges objectively determining the external objectivity absolutely. The connection of purpose is therefore more than judgment. It is the syllogism of the self-subsistence free concept that through objectivity unites itself with itself in conclusion. Thanks, Adam. Um, to reflect on the, on the first paragraph, it's interesting how in his discussion of, of Kant, um, Kant has the, the maxims as things that are applied to the, to the situation as the case may be, while also being external, um, which it seems to me to be quite self-contradictory almost because if there is subjective maxim that is only applied as the case may be, then there must be some inherent, something inherent to the case, by which allows you to apply the maxim to the situation. Um, and if not, then you just have, you know, pure uh, arbitrary, like it's purely arbitrary, purely external. Um, in which case I don't, you know, you haven't, <laughs> you haven't actually moved, you don't have maxims, you don't have um, oughts even, you don't, like, the, 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 you can't have an ought if the event does not have some content, and he seems to want to deny that these uh, events to which we apply maxims have content in themselves, um, at least in Hegel's reading. Um, I, couldn't speak to to if that's a correct reading of Kant. Um, and yeah, and, and I think he, it is then interesting that he, he, he connects how Kant sees teleology, that it's, it's this kind of, this discussion of, of Kant's view of maxims with the concrete universal, um, because that this would suggest to me at least that um, what's going to happen in teleology is that we're going to have um, subjectivity, so judgment, uh, reflection, uh, brought back into the or sort of fully fully united with uh, objectivity. And that's sort of what teleology brings about, um, especially when he says about the connection of purpose is therefore more than a judgment. It is uh, the syllogism of the self-subsistent free concept that through objectivity unites itself with itself. Um, and that seems to me to be saying that this is the point, you know, this is the point at which we have, you know, in teleology, we unite, um, 
the subject with itself. We unite subjectivity with itself um, through 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 objectivity, um, which I think is quite interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not sure if subjectivity is really coming back yet. Although I think that that maybe it will be happening since there are strong hints for that here. Um, but uh, there's a lot of technical vocabulary coming up in uh, the last part that we read, and pretty some pretty extensive claims that he was making. So. Is, is this Hegel's claim or is this Kant's claim when he says that the concept as purpose is an objective judgment and that then judgment is uh, here not in turn not just mere judgment but already syllogism? Yeah, I just uh, did a bit of digging uh, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy on Kantian teleology. Um, pretty, I mean, it seems to be very much in line with what he's saying. The notions of purpose or end and of purposiveness are defined by Kant in the Critique of Aesthetic Judgment in a section on purposiveness in general. A purpose is, quote, the object of a concept insofar as the concept is seen, uh, as the con um, as the, I think this should be is seen, as the object, as the cause of the object. Um, so yeah, the, the, the concept um, has a causal relation to the um, to its object in, in purpose, and purposiveness per is the causality of the concept with respect to its object. Um, it can't be Hegel, though, right? Or it, it is not like kind of similar to Hegel's view, I suppose. Because that well, I think I think it. just just from what Hegel's saying and and what we're seeing, what I see here is the this for Kant, it seems to it seems to lie in the concept, which then causes its object to be determined in a certain way, rather than, it's just one-sidedly subjective, right? This is kind of the ongoing um, critique that Hegel's gonna make, right? That it there's this concept that then is going to causally relate to its object. Uh, and if it's causally relating to it, it must be external to it, right? Um, uh, I've read, I'm a bit more familiar with the lesser logic than the greater logic. Um, there's some great paragraphs at the start of the lesser logic where he talks about, uh, the, the Kantian system and, uh, he, uh, he talks a lot about the reflected, the, basically, uh, he think he, his favorite Kantian critique is the critique of judgment. Um, precisely because it attempts this mediation between uh, universal reason and the particular and attempts to do so in um, this way that's, uh, you know, kind of mediated by an inner purpose where the concept has an inner purpose um, insofar as it uh, reflects upon these particulars. Um, so, yeah, it's a bit, uh, um, I, I, when I read that section, I focused more on what he was talking about with reflective judgment than teleology. <laughs> um, but uh, teleology is grouped along with reflective judgment in the Kantian system and it's the same kind of, and, and that might be exactly what he's talking about here insofar as the, the purpose is uh, an extension or a corollary to the reflective judgment. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Uh, 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 um, I think it's interesting what George was saying because uh, one of the points that interests uh, that for me are really interesting in this part uh, is the thinking uh, of uh, the relation of causality that uh, uh, George was mentioning. Um, and I agree, there's a relation of causality going on here. The problem is that, that it is a paradoxical relation of causality because the purpose in being the concept that causes its object is a, um, it's a, uh, 
it's a cause that come uh, it's a, actually the, the the purpose is a kind of, is the effect that comes uh, after uh, before it goes the, so there is a backward causation going on here uh, which is really problematic for kant <laughs> uh, <laughs> But I think that it is not problematic for Hegel at all, <laughs> like every kind of paradox. <laughs> On the contrary, <laughs> he likes this kind of a paradoxical structure because it's what uh, allows him to uh, uh, present this self-determination structure, uh, self-determining dynamic that is going to be developed along the, uh, the section. Hmm? The, and it is another aspect of the relation between Hegel uh, and Kant uh, that uh, is being worked here. Uh, um, actually, he, when he mentioned this, uh, the first thing he says when he starts mentioning the external purposiveness and the idea of purposiveness in general is the fact that it requires um, um, uh, an intelligence. Hmm? Because normally uh, this problem of a backward causation that is going on uh, with the purpose is solved by putting uh, uh, the effect that is supposed to come after, uh, before the cause in final causality is to put uh, the, the effect uh, in the producer <laughs> that project uh, uh, the design, uh, the object. Uh, the problem is that here we don't have any designer when here we uh, start analyzing the the um, dialectic of teleology but then uh, we will meet uh, the paradox uh, <laughs> again <laughs> I, I i don't know if, if i was clear that it's a lot of things in this in this part but the problem is that we have uh, the purpose which is the effect hmm? and this purpose uh, in it uh, in being what drives the movement of uh, the determination of something comes first, but then the causality is, is uh, backward. Uh, it has a reverse dynamic. Uh, and Hegel needs to solve this problem. We will see how he does that. <laughs> With Kant, I think that the solution, uh, the Kantian solution is that this backward dynamic is just, uh, um, is solved by being just a subjective, uh, 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 having a subjective value. So uh, for Kant, it is as if the nature was there. But that's the problem that uh, Peter was, uh, was mentioning. Uh, so I am applying a, a teleology uh, a structure. Uh, why? <laughs> is it not objectivity that is calling me and saying, look, here, <laughs> Uh, efficient causality is not working <laughs> uh, for uh, explaining what is going on here. Maybe it's better you to use for you to use a, a, a final causality. But then there's something objective going on there, uh, which is what Kant does not say, and uh, which is what uh, Hegel says when he talks of an objective judgment. And I think that when he talks of an objective judgment, he's Hegel that is talking here. It's a gala, it's a gala starting to fight against Kant. <laughs> okay, thanks for that, Michaela. That's uh, it's really good to bear in mind these different um, pulls and poles with regards to uh, what we're up against here. So I'm wondering just like how much of this paragraph is Kant and how much of this is, is Hegel, right? Sorry, could you repeat the question? I didn't understand, sorry. So I'm wondering how much of it in this paragraph is, is Kant and how much is Hegel? I think that he's already putting, uh, make it, trying to make explicit some of his ideas at the, at the end of the paragraph, for sure. Because, uh, 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 especially when he says, when he starts talking about the, the concrete universal, uh, he talk of an objective judgment. Uh, 
and um, the subject, namely the concrete concept, the subdetermining. Uh, he's talking, uh, he's referring of uh, his way to use Kant uh, for presenting his own idea of uh, teleology. But he, he's anticipating what is happening uh, next, because we are still in the introduction. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So we cannot consider uh, this part of the dialectical derivation of the, of the dialectic of teleology. As he always does, he starts uh, uh, in these introductory parts, he go back to what he did uh, and he anticipates, uh, he does some spoilers uh, <laughs> of what is going to happen. So, and there's a lot of, that, that's why I think that are the most difficult parts of the logic because you, don't ever, you, you never know what he's really doing and what he wants to do with this part. Because he anticipates, uh, he goes back and he always puts some, uh, lines uh, uh, where he talks about fundamental stuff like as, like the like the notion his notion of truth in the first paragraph we read uh, he talks about it if I'm ra uh, not wrong he mentioned some interesting thing about uh, about his notion of uh, of truth in the last lines uh, in the last the last uh, the last couple of lines uh, when he when he says, when he says, uh, um, but uh, should we maybe read the last uh, paragraph then? Because then we we have through the introduction and we're uh, ah, okay. Time okay. is flying past. Okay. Uh, okay. Is that right, Michaela? Yeah. All right, cheers. Uh, Maria, would you like to read? Okay. Purpose has resulted as a third to mechanism and chemism. It is their truth. Inasmuch as it still stands inside the sphere of objectivity or of the immediacy of the total concept, it is still affected by externality as such and has an objective world over against it to which it refers. From this side, mechanical causality to which chemism is also in general to be added, still makes its appearance in this purposive perpo connection, which is the external one, but as subordinated to it and as ablated in and for itself. As regards the more precise relation, the mechanical object is as immediate totality indifferent to its being determ determined and consequently, conversely, its being a determinant. This external determinateness has now progressed to self-determination, and accordingly, the concept that in the object was only inner, or which amounts to the same only outer, is now positive. Purpose is in the first instance precisely this concept which is external to the mechanical object. And so for chemism also, Purpose is a self-determining, determining, which brings the external determinateness conditioning, condi conditioning it back to the unity of the concept. We have here the nature of the subordination of the two preceding forms of the objective process. The other, which in those forms lies in the infinite progress, is the concept posited at first as external to them. And this is purpose. Not only is the concept their substance, but externality is for them also an essential moment, constituting their determinateness. Thus, mechanical or chemical technique, because of its character of being externally determi determined, naturally offers itself to the connection of purpose, which we must now examine more closely. Examine. Thanks, Ria. <laughs> So this is, you know, this is pretty interesting, this conclusion, because, or the conclusion to the introduction, because you have within mechanism and chemism external determination of the object. Um, and from one aspect that is 
non-teleological, right? That that's because uh, there is no inner determination, and yet this determination from without is the most basic form of purpose, right? Um, so there's the connection to purpose, even uh, insofar as we're considering um, uh, what is being acted on from without. Well, um, so you know, I think we're so we're going to kind of begin the inner dialectic of teleology from the position of uh, you know a kind of scientific object that might be manipulated or, you know, uh, engineered in mechanism and chemism for some external purpose. Um, but this is still the idea of purpose, right? This is still the idea of, um, you know, uh, taking, you know, having an end, having a, a goal, I guess you could say, because we were talking earlier about, you know, is this internal or external, the purpose, and clearly it has to, the, the truth of teleology has to be inner purpose, but the dialectic begins with this, um, the the sort of uh, basic external purpose that we see in you know the, the scientific manipulation of objects, um, and just one other point upon that, uh, it's really interesting with Kant that the the critique of judgment includes both um, aesthetic judgment, right? The critique of of judgment and um, uh, teleology, right? And, and, and when Hegel talks about Kant, it's kind of like, you know, the Kantian system is, uh, you know, kind of proceeding from a scientific object in the world of mechanism, right? Where there is no reflective inner principle, right? It is, uh, you know, you're, you're considering causes, conditioning other causes, you're considering Newtonian mechanics and so forth. Um, and it's really interesting that Kant, right, you know, without any input from Hegel, in this third critique on judgment, you know, groups these two phenomena of aesthetic judgment and uh, um, teleology. And, and, and Hegel's reading of, you know, that critique is basically these are both internal uh, phenomena that must be regarded by, you know, a kind of different logic than the um, categories Kant has already established, right? And, and Hegel thinks this is the move in the right direction, and that's going to be his own move. But, you know, you know, Kant's trying to put it, keep it in his own vocabulary and keep it in his own uh, system. So you end up with reflective judgment and purpose as a kind of mediation of, you know, a prior subjectivity and an object. Um, but uh, it's interesting because there are, are specific phenomena, I think, um, that give rise to these insights that Hegel uh, is talking about. So, uh, you know, aesthetic uh, experience and biology, frankly, the whole scientific enterprise of biology, um, as opposed to, to mechanism. Yeah, um, so like, as we're saying, George, um, you know, scientific and technological developments are manipulating objects, right? And so there is a certain, you know, there's purpose at work in those manipulations and those those alterations, right? But uh, is is the change happening because you know the determining is added purely externally, or is there something in the object itself that uh, you know enables this? this determination to occur in such such a way, right? So is is the object really the one that's in charge in the sense that it allows itself to be sublated or it negates itself to be, you know, taken up by a, an external purpose and so on? It's interesting that he, he, um, he says, we have the subordination of the two preceding forms of the objective process. The other, which in those forms lies in the infinite progress is the concept posited at first as external to them. And this is purpose. Um, that seems to me to be quite similar to, to what he discusses, you know, very famously, the, um, the dialectic of, of finite and, and 
like the, the finite, the bad infinite, and the true infinite. Um, that seems to me this language of infinite process, uh, infinite progress. Um, that he, I think he's connecting this with, yeah, with both um, chemism and mechanism. Um, it's quite interesting then that I think there is a there is a taking up of prior prior categories in the in the uh, objective logic in this now, um, though in I think different but yeah in different positions. But um, that I think is quite interesting interesting thing to consider at least in regards to. Um, inner purposiveness because obviously we've been saying oh inner purposiveness is the is the the higher but he also he objects to um accordingly accordingly to the concept that in the object was only inner or what amounts to the same only outer is now positive so he's he seems to me to be to be objecting to a view um as well of, of um pure purely internal uh, purpose or subjectivity that has no regard for the outer that then ends up being just, just a form of exteriority. Um, so it would seem then that, that if we were to have this fully developed concept of teleology, of um, inner self-determination, that this has to have some kind of relationship to to external tell you, uh, to external purposes or to the outer in general um, and that's quite interesting because that that would then sort of that would then imply almost that this true concept of teleology um, involves some kind of self exteriorization that is its own end that so, or that is its own purpose, so that the 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 inner externalizes as outer, and in this returns to itself, um, which you also see in uh, the discussion of the absolute of um, absolute attribute mode, where the mode is full externalization that is in the same way return to to the absolute. Um, so it would be it's interesting. It would be it's an interesting thing to consider if if we'll see a similar sort of thing here less so for um for absolute identity which is the absolute pure i as i whatever um but now being applied to a specific object um i think that would be interesting to consider um yeah i think you're absolutely right about the the essentialist dichotomy of inner and outer. So when Hegel has been using inner here, we, we need, I think we need to give it a new sense or at least a placeholder for a new sense that's going to overcome the essentialist divide between inner and outer, external and internal. Because if you just pick one of them, you just, you just fall back into the dichotomy. So if whatever teleology turns out to be in its truth will have to be something yeah, that overcomes that um, divide in that gap. Um, we are now well well over time so I would uh, suggest that we uh, stop it here and uh, we reconvene for uh, next week to continue and get into the logic proper. But I think this has been a really good start and I've really enjoyed the conversation we've had. It's been very fruitful. All right, all right th thanks people. Uh, Thank then, you. Uh, then we'll see each other next week. Bye. Yeah, Bye. have a good week everybody. May it have lots of purpose in your week. <laughs> <laughs>